the dead, but this is not that Lazarus. That is Lazarus of Bethany. This is the beggar of the front gate of the rich man's house, Lazarus. This Lazarus isn't coming back from the dead, in fact, in death. He's not having such a horrible time of it. He's taken to spend his eternal life at the side of Abraham. Not a bad place to be, I suppose, especially for a pious Jew in Jesus' time. Lazarus, the beggar who allowed dogs to lick his sores in life, got his reward in death. But I think we can all agree to some extent this is not necessarily a feel-good piece of scripture. In fact, I find it quite troubling. We talk so much about God's saving grace and all-encompassing loves, and as Presbyterians, we don't totally always ascribe to the classical idea of hell. Or at least we don't talk about it on the average. But Jesus is literally talking to these money-loving Pharisees about the wrath of the afterlife to come if they don't turn around and change their ways. So this is one of those passages that as I was reading it, I did cringe a little because talking about the afterlife as a this or that kind of a concept is never comfortable or easy for me. But that's what Jesus does, right? He makes us uncomfortable for the sake of God's will, and he does it all these years later. But here we have a rich man. Now, we never knew his name. He remains anonymous. He wears fine linen and purple cloth, which signify power, privilege, wealth, and status. This man doesn't need to have a name because for our sake and for the sake of those listening to Jesus tell his parable, he represents a very particular group of people. His house is gated, meaning there is a wall between him and whoever might be on the other side of that wall. And it just happens in this story to be Lazarus, a man who wears sores on his body, and the only ones that notice him or show mercy are the dogs that lick his wounds. Lazarus, though, is given a name. And not just any name, the name Lazarus comes to us from the Hebrew word Elazar, meaning God has helped. In his life, God had not necessarily helped this man yet, but we know Jesus stood for the poor and the oppressed. Jesus stood for people like this, the Lazaruses of the world, and that it is in this life after that the Lazaruses of our world will find their rest and comfort. So while the rich man signifies a class of people, Lazarus does as well. The difference here is that by giving Lazarus the name, he is humanized, and so are all the others like him. When we give someone or something a name, we see it differently. It's like the chickens on my grandfather's farm, when he would tell us not to name them, because he knew we'd be seeing them on the kitchen table at some point, and he didn't want us to recognize them. I'm sure you've all been in places like that before. Maybe not with chickens. But this group of people, the Lazaruses of the world, they are given a name because we're meant to see them and recognize them. Now Lazarus sits outside the gate, hoping to eat whatever might be left over from one of the regular feasts that the rich man enjoys, even if it's just tiny crumbs. Now if you're a dog owner, how often have you let your dog eat the leftovers from your plate? Anybody guilty in here of that? Yeah, that's okay. You don't have to out yourself on that one. But I'm guilty of it. I'm sure lots of us are. And we do it because they look so sweet with those big eyes and those wagging tails and those faces that say, I love you so much. I know you're going to give me that chicken leg. <laughs> and we don't think twice about it. We give in and we let them consume the leftovers because it's instinctual for us. And frankly, they're right there. It's easy. That is what some would call normal behavior. But it's also become normal behavior to give our scraps to the dogs of the world rather than the Lazaruses of the world. We become a little desensitized when it comes to what we have and what we have to give that's left over from what we've already consumed. Before Tara and I came to Stanford, when I was working in Chicago at Fourth Presbyterian Church downtown, it was common in the early mornings when the city was just waking up 
to see people sleeping in the doorsteps of stores or in the little alcoves of our church. And it was just as common to see those same people on each corner every day as they asked for handouts. And honestly, the ones that were the most successful at giving handouts were the people who had dogs as their companions. And that's what I imagine when I think of Lazarus sitting outside the gates of this man's house. Specifically, I imagine the man who would actually sit under our sign at the northwest corner of our church on Chicago's Gold Coast while his little dog bundled up in the wintertime so we'd keep him warm. And one Ash Wednesday, I was outside the church for the dispensing of ashes, and he and I were talking. And he told me about how his dog ate better than he did. He said, people would rather go out and buy my dog dog food than give me a buck. You know, it'd save a lot more money if they just gave me a buck. Dog food's expensive. But that's the reality, is that we are quicker to go out of our way to buy dog food for a dog than we are to offer fellow humans a piece of cash. I'm willing to bet that the same dogs that licked Lazarus' sores probably found themselves at the table of that rich man at some point, eating those leftovers. But the story goes on, and like taxes, death comes for each of us. And it did for these two men. The rich man buried, meaning that in his death, others honored him, grieving his passing, mourning him. But Lazarus was given no such burial. Who was there to remember him? Who would have given him a burial? The dogs? No. He was taken by the angels to be at the side of Abraham for his eternity, the father of the faith, something a pious and practicing Jewish person would have longed for. And when the rich man didn't end up at the side of Abraham, he looked up from his low place, seeing Lazarus at Abraham's side, and called out to him, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am suffering. But Abraham quickly reminded him that wasn't possible. And so the rich man begs Abraham to then send Lazarus, to warn his brothers so they won't end up in the same fate as him. But Abraham makes what I think to be the most significant point of this story. They have Moses and the prophets. And if they won't listen to them, then a risen dead man won't be able to change their hearts and lives any more than the founders of their faith would be able to. One of my new favorite shows, Dairy Girls, focuses on five Catholic teenagers living in Derby, Northern Ireland during the 1990s in the midst of the Troubles when fighting between Catholics and Protestants was going on. Viewers are introduced to Erica and her ragtag group of misfit friends and family. And in one of the earlier episodes, Erica's dog, Toto, whom she is mourning because he has recently died, is miraculously risen from the dead after dying and being buried in a box in her backyard. <laughs> she spots the dog on the way to school that morning with her friends and convinced that it is her dog resurrected, they make chase after it into a church. Now, without spoiling the story because I do think it's a show you should all go watch, the dog causes a statue of the Virgin Mary to weep and a miracle is witnessed by the teens. Erica knows that it's not a miracle, but says nothing because she won't be able to explain what just happened. Now the other four teens truly believe a miracle has happened right in front of their eyes, but instead of changing their mischievous ways at seeing this miracle brought to them from the risen dog, the teens end up trying to exploit the miracle for their own selfish desires, eventually making the front page of the newspaper only to be labeled as frauds. But even in their genuine belief that a miracle had happened in front of them, they still don't get it. Now, I mentioned earlier that this passage makes me cringe a little because it uses that heaven-hell metaphor. But there's another thing that's even more cringe-worthy about this passage for me. It's the fact that for most of us, we don't identify with Lazarus. And like any reader or consumer of a story, we look for someone to identify with. 
And so there's the uncomfortable reality that most of us will turn towards identifying with the unnamed rich man than with Lazarus. But I don't think that's where we're ultimately to look for ourselves within this parable. You see, we are the brothers of the rich man. We are the ones that are still living here on earth. We're the ones that stand a chance to get it right. We still have Moses and the prophets, and we have Jesus and the apostles. We don't need someone to rise from the dead to let us know that we need to get it together. And not for the sake of staying out of eternal damnation, but for the sake of others. For the sake of the children we leave this earth to, for the sake of relieving suffering swiftly for those who need it. For the sake of showing God's love and mercy to the world. With this parable, the writer of Luke stresses his eternal concern for the faithful stewardship of material goods. But material resources are one thing. Yes, we should be acting as good stewards of our money. Let's just get that out there. We should absolutely be thinking about where it goes to when we spend it. And we should be paying attention to the resources we consume and how we dispose of them. We should be thoughtful so we don't continue to toss single-use plastics into our oceans, effectively suffocating God's waterways and God's creatures out there. We should be really conscious of what we consume, how we consume it, and what we do with all of it. But what's not as explicit in this story is the part where, as people of means and resources, we, like the rich man and his brothers, also have power and privilege regardless of the size of our pocketbooks. Take myself for an example. I am literally standing in a raised pulpit, given a voice by the church and her people within it to stand up here and try to say things that are relevant and faithful and move all of us to do better. This isn't just part of my calling, it's also part of my privilege because I was able to get an education in college, and then I was able to go to seminary. I have a stable family and communities that have walked alongside me to help me out when I needed it as a young person. You know, a lot of people, they don't get that kind of support. I thank God I was born into a suburban family where both of my parents had educations and good jobs, and I never had to wonder where my next meal was coming from, nor do I now. I stand on the stones of immense privilege. We all do. All of us sitting in this building hold places of privilege and power in our jobs or in our schools or in our communities, and they're not equal, but they exist. Writer and activist Brittany King defines privilege as something that refers to the unearned opportunity one gets for simply being who they are. It does not mean that one with privilege never experiences hardships. However, having privilege comes with a responsibility to use it wisely and better those who do not have the same privilege as you. The rich man in our story had privileges simply because he had means to be comfortable and to make others comfortable. The rich man, and probably his brothers as well, moved through their world without the same kind of hindrances that the Lazaruses of the world do. They didn't have to worry about getting adequate medical attention if they had a sore on their body. No, they knew where their next meal was. They had clothing that was not only suitable, but that was lavish. And so it is our responsibility to be conscious of our privileges and powers that we hold. And then look out for the Lazaruses out there. Because having privilege doesn't make you a bad person, not at all. But failing to look beyond it, to look beyond the gates we have been able to construct in our world, that is when we fail. Now, we can spend our money on buying new underwear for Undie Sunday all we want. And yes, we are doing something good. We're giving something people really need. Underwear is real important, y'all. It is. But we will get stuck as the rich man and his brothers if we don't look around that gate and move beyond just buying underwear for people and see that the Lazarus of the world, they are the ones that are in need of those things. 
That's the cardinal sin here, friends. We fail to look beyond our own lives and see those right outside of our gates who are in need. We know they're there, but do we really see them? Do we recognize them? Do we know their names? Can we recognize Lazarus on the street or in our schools or in or outside of our churches or our work buildings when we see him or her or them? If we can't, that's on us. Because we've gotten what we need from the prophets and from Jesus and from the apostles. Now we have to do some serious looking beyond our own privileges to see those things that create the community of Lazarus. Too often I hear those in positions of power and privilege telling minority groups that they need guidance in how to be better. It's like when society looks to people of color to tell us how to change our racist systems. We don't need them to tell us. In fact, it's not their job to tell us how to break down our racist systems in the world. It's our job to work on our self-awareness to see the things in place that promote privilege to some, and not all because of color or gender or socioeconomic status, whatever. It is our job to open our eyes and to look at ourselves and our worldly structures and say, gosh, that's not right, we gotta change that, and then do it. It is not the job of the Lazaruses of the world to rise from the dead and get our attention to tell us to do better. We already have all we need, so let's stop depending on the labor and efforts of others to tell us how to be better and use all we have and just do better. We don't need another blog about how to be kind to each other. I know for a fact all of you in this building already know how to do that. We have all we need. We don't need a risen from the grave dog or a risen Lazarus to tell us to get our acts together. Now, one of my favorite things we do as a church here is when folks get together and cook a meal for the men of Pacific House or the people who come for lunches at New Covenant. Now, if you're looking for a mission opportunity, this is a great one. I really appreciate those places because when everyone comes together and creates a meal for people, many of them strangers, we don't just go drop it off. We get an opportunity to move around some of those gates and we get to see the faces of these people. We get to engage with them. And it, it might not be much, but it is one way we can recognize those in our community that sit outside the gates. So when we see them outside of other places, we don't see them as just another face asking for a handout, or we don't see them as just another person standing on the side of the road waiting for work. We see them as a person with a story who is beloved by God just as we are. You know, that's where the rich man failed, but we don't have to. We are fortunate enough that we are the brothers in this story, and we have all that we need. If we choose not to act, not even the dead waking, walking can wake us from our desensitization to the needs of others. So now is the time to wake up. Now is the time to see the Lazaruses of our world here and now. It is not too late. In fact, now is the perfect time to do it. Amen.